So this is just the introduction to the session. We thought uh, because it's a two-day session, we kind of have to explain a little bit what we're going to be doing here for two days. What is what part of the science are we are we interested in here, and uh, what are the methods and the epistemological basis of uh, of all the all the techniques, methods, and case studies that will be presented over the next two days. Um, and we will start with a few definitions, just so that we all are on the same page. So we start with a simple definition of the model. A model is a simplified, simplified version of a real system. So you can see a really lovely fire truck. Uh, my kids really like playing with fire trucks. And as far as they're concerned, this is a perfect model of a fire truck. It's not a fire truck. It's made out of plastic. It's pretty small. It doesn't drive on its own. It would not fit any people inside because it's this big. And uh, it will never put down a fire. There's no way it could do that. Um, but it is a good model as far as they're concerned because it's red, it has wheels, and it looks like what they think a fire truck is. If you wanted to build, uh, if you needed to build a model of a fire truck in order to say analyze how they, how the, how the, how it moves and how do you fit people inside, you would also build a model. But that model would con would consist of completely different aspects. It probably wouldn't be red because that's pretty irrelevant. Um, it would probably have much more detail inside and it would have all sorts of, of elements like, I don't know, maybe a little engine or something like, or, or the wheels that move in a realistic way. Uh, because those, were be, well, those would be the aspects that are interesting for you. So a model is a simplified version, it's always simplified, it's not, it doesn't have the same complexity as the real thing. And it includes aspects that are important to the researchers. And what are those aspects? Um, are the key aspects uh, of the real system or not, this is a, a matter of debate. But as far as uh, we're concerned, if the researcher says they are important, then that's what they are. So a simulation is simply a model plus the arrow of time. When things change, when things evolve, when, um, when things uh, change over time, we don't create a model, we create a simulation. But at the very core of it, it's the same thing. So. So when do we use a simulation? Um, the main use for simulation is in any situation when we're interested in some kind of process, but we cannot observe it directly. So you might have heard a lot about, say, uh, pedestrian simulations used for evacuation purposes. Well, this is pretty obvious that uh, if I wanted to see how quickly I can, we can get everyone out, I cannot just set a fire in the corner and just, and just count the time until everyone gets out of the building. You, you create a simulation for that. Uh, in other cases, building the real system would be too expensive. You don't build a plane and then see whether it works. You, you create models first, first probably a digital model and then maybe a, a simplified small model for the wind tunnel. But you wouldn't just build a, a plane and just kind of hope for the best that it will fly the way it should. Uh, so in those cases, we use simulation and that should all ring a bell, right? Because what is, what are the... The, the main thing that we cannot observe, the processes we're interested, but we can never ever observe them. Well, it's the past, right? I mean, we have no access to it, we'll never ha have access to it, but we're still interested in those processes. And this is why simulation should be a key tool for archaeology, as it is a key tool for almost every other scientific discipline. So this is a Google engram, which means uh, which is basically a tool that Google developed when they scanned those millions and millions of books. They counted the frequency of words. And you can see that from uh, 19, early 20th century, stats and maps, they've been kind of going at the same pace because everyone used statistics, everyone used mathematics. And then you see this rise of simulation where the word simulation has been used more and more and more throughout publications. And uh, I think you can all guess pretty easily what was fueling this growth. I mean, this is the times where, right, yeah, we got computers. Uh, you, you can do simulation without a computer, but it's difficult and uh, computers make it easy and make it more powerful. So, so the reason why simulation had such a, you know, amazing rise to prominence in science is because they represent the third leg of the, what we call the tripod of science. Uh, the tripod of science is basically a, a metaphor that tells us that in science we basically base our observation, our understanding of the world on three things. On observation, which is basically data. On theory, which is our ideas, how things function. 
and on modeling, which checks whether our ideas, how things function, are actually consistent with the data. So when you look at the research process, um, you know, we all very familiar with data analysis. With data analysis, we look at our pots and our settlements and our houses and all sorts of things that we collect as archaeologists. And we create a description of those individual elements into global patterns. So we use topologies to see the change over time. We use statistics and spatial analysis to see how things change. And then we get those population level patterns, the distributions, a change for time, similarities, differences, and changes throughout. In simulation, what we do is we create a model of interaction. We create a model of a process. And that gives us the ability to understand causality. That, that gives us the ability to understand that if X happens, then the result will be Y. And that those, those patterns will be very similar to the ones that, that, that were created by the data. So we get, again, distributions, change for time, similarities and differences, which we can then compare in the final step to say whether the model of the causality is actually consistent with the data we have. So there are three reasons why you would model in archaeology. Theory building, hypothesis testing, and what I call the middle range research. So in theory building, you basically check whether your hypothesis is logically coherent. So very often it is easy to say, well, I think uh, people, when the first out of Africa was fueled by the fact that uh, people figure out the fire. But actually, there was also other aspects that you cannot ignore, like population growth, like change, environmental change, like different adaptation patterns. And you just, it's very difficult to put it all together and see what the result of the, of the interactions between all those factors would be. That's why you create a simulation that not necessarily will be there compared to the data. It will be, the result will be like, yes, the combination of those, of those factors will give a rise to a dispersal process or a combination of those factors will not give rise to a dispersal. We were actually all wrong all along. So the theory building is a really important element for, for simulation archaeology because our theories are very often very underdetermined and very underdefined because we do them in natural language, which means we leave a lot of space for vagueness and you know underdetermination. Simulations uh, can help us with that. The second thing is hypothesis testing. You know, when you think about fall of Rome, you know, the number of hypotheses of what has caused it is immense. And at, a, at some point it became a sparring match of who shouts louder, their hypothesis. There's like a lot of them sound equally plausible and at the, at the, at the, at the side of it could have been true. Uh, simulation can allow us to compare each of them against the data and see which one of them is more likely than the other. And finally, a middle range research is pretty much what I explained to you earlier with this idea of observing an accessible system. So in middle range research, that was usually uh, ethnographic research, but here you just observe the computer stuff and then comparing it to archeological remains to see whether the processes that you can either observe in the field as an ethnographer or in the computer as a digital archeologist could have given rise to the patterns of data that you observe in archeological record. So there are different types of simulation, but we have our favorite tool, as you'll see throughout this day, uh, which is agent-based modeling. And this is a non-equation-based type of simulation. At first sight, there are equations underneath, we just ignore them. Uh, and it's a simulation type that consists of individual autonomous software units, agents, and they can do everything that we can do, sometimes better. So there's been a lot of different applications of archaeological uh, ABM. The cultural learning and innovation stuff, the societal change with uh, hierarchical societies, human immigration has been a very big one, subsistence strategies and resilience, all those kind of big process patterns that we're like, you know, interested at the end of the day have been done as ABMs. And there is a scope for much more than that. I will skip over the example of artificial Anastasi because uh, it just shows what, because uh, I'm running out of time. But uh, I just wanted to very quickly comment on the second day of our, of our uh, session, which is mostly focused on networks. So there's networks and there's IBM, and you would have thought, what is the connection? Uh, so let me explain. Complexity science is the connection. Complexity science is basically a part of science that is concerned with studying complex systems. And you 
you know, as, as one of my favorite researchers once said, you know, the study of non-complex, he said non-linear systems is basically like saying the, the zoology is a study on non-elephant animals. Pretty much everything is complex. And what I mean by complex is that complex systems may and usually are very simple, but they are very difficult to predict. Uh, at the same time, they, they consist of many elements and those elements interact with each other, like for example, humans. But, and those interactions can be simple. They can be say, you know, selling, buying, or um, spreading uh, an information. But the results of those interactions, of the combination of those interactions are not simple. And they are actually very difficult to predict. And that's what makes simulation an important tool uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the studying them. This is an example of flocking, which is one of the best examples of what, I, what is a complex system. Little birds flying around, they create those amazing flocks and they react to predators. They can, they can move in all directions. And shockingly, it's not because they have a leader, it's not because they're smart, it's because they follow very few behavioral rules. In fact, they only follow three rules. They basically say, let's not be too close to other birds because we'll bump into each other and that will be a disaster, but let's be fairly close. So you don't wanna just fly away in the, in the opposite direction. And let's roughly align to, with the direction to other birds. And from those three rules, you get um, absolutely fantastic flocking behavior that can be observed in the real world and also simulated if that works. Yes. Or not. Come on. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think you'll have to... No. <laughs> you will have to trust me that uh, you can see simulations that look exactly like the real flocking behavior and they can be built in one afternoon. So the most common tool to study behavior of complex system is simulation. And the most common way of representing the structure of, the structure of those system is a network. And this is the, net, the connection. Networks and simulation equals complexity science. I don't want anyone uh, arguing with that. That's, that's what I say. Uh, there's some more resources if you're more interested in, uh, in those topics. Uh, and and, but I think those two days that are coming today and tomorrow will already give you quite a lot of good grounding in what complexity science is, what simulation is, what networks are, and why should we use them more and more and more in archaeology. And on that cheerful note, I'll finish. Thank you.